Knight of Champions. Knight of Champions. Knight of Champions. Knight of Champions? I just, I don't know. Really having a hard time trying to quantify how I feel about the show, honestly. I mean, now granted, there were things that I definitely liked about this event. I like the fact that Kevin Owens won the Intercontinental Championship. He seems to be a guy to me that is perfectly suited to be the IC champion because they actually give him some mic time at least, at least some. You feel like the belt's not going to totally drop off of the face of the earth, although you know no matter what, if a certain somebody is going to be the U.S. champion, they are always going to make sure that the IC champion feels second rate by comparison. Um, I'm fine with them winning. I, do I wish maybe they would have waited until Hell in a Cell or Hell even did it on Raw at this point as, as the time to do it? Maybe. But as I said going into this, I was going to be okay if Ryback walked out with the championship or if Kevin Owens walked out with the championship. So I don't have any complaints here. And like I said, for me, Kevin Owens makes sense as an Intercontinental Champion. Also, what's not to like about there being a new Divas Champion? Now, granted, let's be honest. While a lot of us pretend to care, we really don't care about the Divas. We just don't. And maybe it's about high time we stop acting like we do. It's also about high time maybe that the WWE stops acting like they do. Now, with that said, the one thing I think we could all agree on is that Nikki Bella's never-ending, record-setting title reign needed to come to an end, and needed to come to an end here on Sunday unless the WWE was going to try and troll us. I don't give a damn if it was Paige, if it was Sasha Banks, if it was frickin' Becky Lynch, or in this case, Charlotte. doesn't matter to me. There's a new Divas champion who gives a shit about match quality. Somebody else other than Nikki Bella. Now she could go back to letting John Cena motorboat her. And I also really, really like the way that this tag title match was booked between the Dudley Boys and the New Day. This is pretty much what I exactly said should happen in my Night of Champions preview. And hence, that's basically where the WWE went with this. They really just, it's like they ripped it off from me. I know they didn't. This is their own thing, whatever the case might be. But see how much better this worked? Everybody wins. The Dudleys don't get the titles yet. You save that moment for another show. The New Day retains, therefore giving them at least a little bit more heat, making people want to see the Dudley Boys win the belts even more. And yet the Dudley Boys still get in their spot in their moment where they send somebody through the table and everybody goes home happy. Just because you can do a title change sometimes doesn't mean you have to. And just because it would work doesn't mean it should work. I'm glad the WWE was on point with this, and booked this match exactly how the fuck they should have. Now, that was pretty much all I liked about this show. The rest of the show either fits into one or two categories. Either it was stupid, or just perfectly embodies the WWE today. Let me go ahead and talk about the things that I thought were stupid on this show. There wasn't a lot, so this shouldn't take too long. While surely a lot of you could circle jerk to the thought of Dolph Ziggler beating Rusev, and maybe a lot of you are getting down with him, perhaps playing both sides with Summer Rae and Lana. This whole thing is just stupid. I know that Lana got hurt, so that maybe changed the plans here a little bit. But ultimately, you were building towards something that wasn't going to be delivered. This should have been either Summer Rae versus Lana at this pay-per-view, or at least, if nothing else, a mixed tag match. And instead, we got neither. We got a, yet another Dolph Ziggler versus Rusev one-on-one -on -one match, which I had no interest in seeing. I just didn't. I'm not vibing with the fact that now all of a sudden Dolph Ziggler is trying to manipulate Summer Rae because, again, that's not grounded in reality. Summer Rae trying to fuck up Dolph Ziggler's thing makes perfect sense. Lana not believing Dolph Ziggler, even though his explanation makes total and perfect sense, is 100% the truth. That is believable. This shit that we're doing now absolutely makes no sense. The next thing I expect him to fucking do is have him come out and raw. Here's Summer Rae and his Lana, and he's going to have his Tommy Dreamer on it. He says, my God, I'll take them both. I'm hardcore. And then we get to me what was the stupidest thing of the night from a pure stupidity standpoint, and that was a six-man tag between the Wyatt family and what's left of the Shield and whoever the hell they were going to choose for their mystery partner. Just so many things about this were so freaking stupid. First of all, heading into it, it's stupid because after all this time, this is what we've come back to. This is the best that we have for all parties involved. 
We don't have anything planned out for Roman Reigns or Dean Ambrose. We don't have anything planned out for Bray Wyatt and or the Wyatt family. You know, you brought Luke Harper back into the fold. Now we're introducing, we're, it's like we're rehashing everything. We want to rehash the Shield and we want to rehash the Wyatt family. Well, why are you doing this? You know, I get the Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose, Manfest. That's fine because at some point in time you can do something with that. And that will be an interesting story if and when you decide to split them off and do something. That's good. That's fine. You know, the Wyatt family thing, eh, it's whatever. Well, we get to this match here. And I know that this is supposed to be a showcase for Braun Strowman. And I understand that. And it should be a showcase for Braun Strowman. Now, once I get past the fact that he looks like a roided up version of my Uncle Ludo, you know, I, I get it. But you have Reigns and Ambrose. And they can choose whoever the hell they want. And this is where it gets really fucking stupid. If I see on the other end a dude that is fucking huge, probably, what, 6'8", if not bigger, 300-plus pounds, and I could find somebody, if this is the real world, wouldn't I want to find somebody that I know is either, A, a total legit badass, or somebody that could at least measure up size-wise? You would think, you would think. But no, Reigns and Ambrose decide of all the fucking people that they're going to bring in. They're going to bring in Chris fucking Jericho. And while sure a lot of you pop because it was fucking Jericho, and a lot of you think this is fucking great because it was Jericho, and you're like, it's okay because Jericho did the job, and yeah, it's awesome. No, it's fucking stupid. And it made Reigns and Ambrose look stupid. It made this whole thing look fucking stupid. Let's put this into an NFL context. If I'm rolling into a backyard uh, alley brawl, a backlot brawl, if you will, Am I going to choose J.J. Watt or fucking Johnny Football? Now, if I was rolling into a competition of rolling $20 bills and taking some blow up the nose, going through a couple lingas, I might go with Manziel. But in terms of a backlot brawl and alley fight, I'm taking fucking J.J. Watt. If I got one basketball game to win, am I picking Kobe Bryant or I'm not picking Smush fucking Parker? Well, I'm not saying Chris Jericho is a Smush Parker equivalent in terms of wrestling. I'm saying he's a Smush Parker equivalent in terms of the ridiculousness of these guys have a fucking monster and you go with somebody that's damn near my fucking size. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. You get into a situation, you get into trouble, and there's a 6'8", 300-something pound dude, and you need help and you come to me, I'm going to tell you to go find somebody fucking else. There ain't no way in the world I'm fucking winning. How stupid and fucking ridiculous this whole thing was. The whole assertion that I'm supposed to be behind the fact that Jericho comes out to help. Oh, Jesus H. Christ. And what even makes this more ridiculous is you knew they were bringing Kane back at this show. And they used Kane later in the night anyways. They still could have used Kane later in the night in the exact way that they did or something close to it and have Kane appear here. You say, well, Braun Strowman needs to go over. Well, then just have him fucking pin Dean Ambrose. Is that going to put Dean Ambrose over any less? Is that going to affect Dean Ambrose any more? No. Because frankly, he doesn't really fucking matter all that much because they're not doing shit with him anyways. Obviously, they're going to push K because it's fucking K and we love to push the 40 and over crowd. Why not bring him in here and at least you say monster versus fucking monster. This means something that isn't stupid. So while that stuff was stupid, and again, I stand by everything I just said because it's fucking true. It's ridiculous. We go beyond that. And I guess you could classify what I'm going to talk about next as being stupid as well, but it's more so to be a representation of what the WWE is and why the WWE is what they are today, and in particular why their product is where it's at and why their audience continues to drop. And sadly, when it comes to the WWE being who the WWE is today, it's all these things that involve Seth Rollins on Night of Champions. And let's start off with the U.S. Championship match. You know, I thought that once they took the title off of John Cena, that they would have kept the title off of John Cena. Because putting the belt right back on John Cena doesn't solve the problem of you have nobody legitimately that could take on challenge and, you know, believably beat John Cena for that title. You know, there's no challengers. There's no obstacles. Again, as always the case, he is the challenge, he is the obstacle, making him the biggest villain on the brand, as opposed to the biggest hero. So, of course, the WWE, in their infinite stupidity, decides, hey, 
John Cena lost once, he's always got to get that motherfucker back, and I should have fucking known better, and we should all know better by now. I don't even know why we get angry about it. Just allow the WWE to continue to have their ratings go down, and maybe someday they'll come to their senses, but of course they won't. They'll just think that they need to put all the titles on fucking John Cena. Oh, seriously, though. Who the fuck thought this was a good idea? They always got to do this shit, though. Even if somebody else is the world champion, they've always got to make it known that John Cena is the number one. And that anything that he's involved with is number one. And now again, you've created a situation where the U.S. champion is going to be not of a similar importance to, or slightly below, slightly below the world champion. He's going to be of a greater importance than the world champion. Because the WWE can't fucking help themselves. They can't get over the cancer that they created, which is the John Cena fucking monster. This shit is ridiculous. Holy hell. They just can't help themselves. Cena loses. He's got to get it right back. Cena lost the title. He's got to get it right back. Ultimately, just like everything else involving the WWE, especially epitomized in John Cena, it ended up being a waste of fucking time. Just like Cena's, frankly, title reign as U.S. champion was a waste of time. And this next one, Newsflash, is going to fucking be too. And again, I'll just emphasize that is the WWE in a nutshell. They just can't get over their John Cena fascination and love fest. They got to make sure that it's clearly established that he could beat the world champion at any point in time. Then why not just make him the fucking world champion and get it over with and get everybody out of their fucking misery? Seriously, why not just do it? Uh, but then we get to what really epitomizes the WWE today. And that is this main event for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. It was like, to me, the obvious truth was staring everybody square in the face. You had one mission, one objective, one goal, one everything on this show. One thing you could not get wrong. One thing that was impossible to screw up. And yet the WWE managed to fucking do it. Now first, let's talk about this match between Sting and Seth Rollins. Heading into this, if any of you had any delusions of this being a great five-star classic or anything like that, I don't know what the fuck you were thinking. This match was never going to be that. This match had no chance of ever being that. Nor, frankly, should it have been. That's not what this was about. This was about somebody like Sting, who has accomplished everything there is to accomplish pretty much in the wrestling world throughout his long career of almost three decades, except for one thing. And that's winning the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. So one thing on his resume he had never accomplished. He had even already wrestled at WrestleMania. Well, two things. He's number one in the WWE in a pay-per-view match. The opportunity is staring you right in the face. You do it, and you figure it out later. And I know some of you will like to say revisionist history now because of what you found out about Sting getting hurt. And I don't think that's a good reason at all. Because a lot of you... If a Daniel Bryan came back and he won the freaking title, but the next night he was going to have to surrender it or later on was going to have to surrender it because of a neck injury, you'd be perfectly fine with that. So what's so fucking different with Sting? Sting winning the belt would mean so much more than, frankly, even a Daniel Bryan winning the title, and it's fucking true, and you know it. You do it, and then you figure it out. You do it, and you have options. You have plans in place, backup plans in place, contingencies, all of this. What's ridiculous to me is the fact that with this match, it was designed to not be something where you had to go out and wrestle a five-star classic. That's not what it should have been about. So why are the people involved with the match, namely Sting and Seth Rollins, trying to make it such? Sometimes that philosophy of KISS, keep it simple, stupid, is the best way to go. And in this particular case, that was the way to go, the only way to go. And I have absolutely no fucking clue why we are risking Sting at 56 years of age with multiple fucking buckle bombs. It's just uncalled for. It's unnecessary. And if this is what it takes to entertain wrestling fans today, then frankly, shame on the business for creating that environment and shame on the fucking wrestling fans for expecting such. You want to watch this shit? Go fucking watch an independent show where guys are in their 20s and they're hungry and they're trying to make a name for themselves. When you get to the big dance and you got somebody in his mid-50s, I respect him for being willing to put his body on the line, but I'm also mad at him too because it's unnecessary. It's a fucking stupid risk. Don't fucking take it. 
It's uncalled for and not needed. And ultimately, it feels like this match wasn't needed. If you were just going to sit there and tease us with Sting actually winning a freaking match at WWE, God forbid that ever fucking happens. Now we're just turning him into an older, more glorified version of a Chris Jericho in terms of the fact we bring him in. <coughs> Excuse me. And he freaking jobs out all the time. Then why the fuck even do it? And this whole thing again about, well, he got hurt. Well, I will say this. Is that if he didn't have a great respect level for Sting heading into this match, or he only had somewhat of respect, he should get a similar level of respect that a lot of us give to Triple H for back in 2001, finishing a match with a torn quad, a dropped quad at that, and allowing Jericho to even put him in the walls of Jericho. A lot of us, myself included, still have a tremendous amount of respect for Triple H that will never die and never go away because of the fact not only did he finish the match, he did something knowing that it was going to hurt like fucking hell and it was unnecessary, but he did it anyways. And in this case with Sting, he did a lot of things in this match that were unnecessary and weren't needed, but did it anyways. And there's something admirable about this. Even though it frustrates me and I thought it was kind of stupid, there's something respectable about that. But most importantly of all, knowing that Sting was legitimately hurt and after that second buckle bomb, you knew he was legitimately hurt. When he tries to get up and he goes down to his knee and they have him in the corner, you know this isn't a work. This is a shoot. There's something wrong with this fucking guy. They bought their time and he still found a way to finish the match. If this was his last go in WWE, if this was his last match, and I hope that's not the case, then at least, if nothing else, allow that to serve as a reminder of why so many people love Sting and why so many people have respected Sting for so many years. Because he was in a situation where he didn't have to do it. And he still finished the match. He did what he was supposed to do, regardless of the consequences or the circumstances. Now, with that said... To me, if you were going to bring out Sheamus anyway, and you were going to bring out Kane anyways, why not just have Sting win the fucking title? Okay, he's hurt. So what? You've stripped people of the title before. Especially if this is going to be his last match in WWE, you never know. If it was, then what better way to send him out? And frankly, from a creative standpoint, what better way to shake shit up and create an element of spontaneity of I don't know what the fuck is coming with a vacated title, Seth Rollins wanting it back, Kane coming after Seth Rollins, Sheamus with the money in the bank, who knows who the fuck else you could throw into the mix. You've got all types of freaking possibilities here. Even if you would have given us the moment of, Sh of Sting winning the belt and then Sheamus instantly cashes in, you could have done that. And at least then Sheamus is the new champion walking out and you at least have some distinct type of possibilities. Or this no gives a fuck Kane, which is always cool to see Kane not give a fuck. You have him coming out and he's choke slamming everybody. You know, that's fucking fine, too. But to me, at the end of the day, the Seth Rollins title reign hasn't been good. Hasn't been good. And you had an opportunity to get out from under it, which was going to benefit all parties involved. And instead, the WWE <laughs> stayed the curse. Because that's what the WWE does. So now they're going to fucking send Kane and Seth Rollins in a title feud because that's what we want to fucking see now. Oh, Christ almighty. At least we could have gotten that great seminal moment of Sting winning the title and then creating an opportunity for something different and fresh feeling come that build up to the next pay-per-view Hell in a Cell. Which, by the way, it doesn't really matter anyways because that show is going to be all about the Hell in a Cell match between Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker or any fucking place. You could have done so many different things here. But of course the WWE, in my opinion, chose poorly. Ultimately, when it comes to Night of Champions... There's one word that really can sum up how I feel about this show and this company right now. Confused. I'm confused as to what their master plan was for this show and why they went the direction that they did. I'm confused as to why the fuck they did what they did and what they were going for and what they're planning going forward. And I'm confused as to what they are going to do going forward and how they're going to make this better. Because I just don't see it. I'm just completely and totally befuddled and ultimately confused.